A special thanks to Formulate for sponsoring this podcast. You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin. And today's episode is going to be part two in our graphic sexual horror series. So... Two episodes ago, if you recall, uh, we did an episode, part one, where I rewatched, revisited a film that I actually discussed years ago on another podcast. It's a documentary called Graphic Sexual Horror, and it chronicled the extreme, extreme, extreme BDSM pornography site from the like mid 90s to early 2000s called Insex. In that episode, the last episode, I discussed insects, who they were, the foundation, and also discussed the film itself. So there's a lot to cover because a lot of the time when talking about a a violent offender or serial killer, extreme pornography is almost always mentioned. And again, just for the record, for any new listeners, I would like to once again double down that I'm not saying that there is a causal relationship between the two of them, but just saying that that's what these episodes are exploring. So first episode was about the movie. Now, when you're talking about extreme pornography, violent BDSM, particularly like sadism, the entire discussion would be incomplete if you didn't discuss the father of it. This episode is going to be about the Marquis de Sade. A lot of people actually don't know much about him. Uh, They may have seen the movie Quill starring Kate Winslet and Jeffrey Rush uh, that basically showed uh, showed his later years. Let's actually talk about one of the craziest people in human history. I mean, he was fascinating, horrible, yet some of his legacies may actually surprise you. Before we get into that, let's just get some quick housekeeping out of the way. Check out our previous episode if you haven't to catch up on this one. Uh, Our last episode was actually a Lori Vallow update. There has been some Lori Vallow news this week. There was a hearing and it was divulged that some tools in Chad Daybell's shed or backyard had testable amounts, it seems like blood on them, uh, that would allow for DNA testing. So later this week, I will be doing an update episode on that because I have a feeling that more news will be coming down the pike on that. And other news, guys, I mean, to be honest, here's the crazy news of the week, okay? Many of you likely remember the episode that we did about Love Has One. Um, there's Mother God, Amy Carlson, Father God, and they have all of these followers all over the world. They ended up in Hawaii and then they settled in California and Colorado. They scattered a bit. But many of you may remember she went on Dr. Phil and it was craziness. A very much so more new agey uh, version of ev- what every other cult believes in. So we covered them and I've been chatting with the wonderful and amazing folks over at Rising Above Love Has One. Uh, Their project involves basically assisting family, friends, or current or previous members of Love Has One, whether you have a family member that's in it and struggling to get out, uh, that needs assistance, whether you just need support as a loved one or friend of someone who was in it. I've been discussing this with them, and we will be doing multiple episodes in the future, a series about the group. And actually, it's in... in, I've been discussing this with the founder of the group for we- a couple weeks now. And the crazy timing, guys, and it's actually sad, is this morning there was a raid on the Love Has One compound. And I'm going to read you directly from Rising Above Love Has One. And so this was yesterday, Thursday morning. It read, It is with deep sorrow that we report the passing of Amy Carlson. To Amy's family, we are all sending you so much love and light at this time. I would urge all of our followers to remember that no matter what she became, 
Amy was also a mom, sister, and daughter to those who loved her and missed her. That is what happened, guys. So yesterday evening, apparently there was a raid at their Colorado compound. Amy Carlson was discovered deceased. Now, this morning, Friday morning, Rising Above Love Has One also posted, because more information came out about Amy Carlson. Uh, It says, yesterday, Jason, whose father God, and all Love Has One followers at that house were arrested and charged with desecration of a corpse and two counts of child abuse. Amy had been deceased for some time, and they brought her back to that house to enshrine her in some way. The two counts of child abuse were because there were two minors present in the home with the body. These two minors are now in protective custody. This continues to be an active investigation, so we hope to hear of more arrests soon, especially of Miguel, the puppet master behind all of this, who conveniently controls all the money and assets. And that is a repost from the Facebook group Love Has One Exposed, uh, which has been following the every move of this group. So for those of you in the back, um, so Amy Carlson, if any of you have been following Love Has One, she deteriorated over the several years that she's been with this group. Uh, her followers worship her more or less call her mother. God, uh, they're constantly doing YouTube lives with like tapestries of her hanging in the background. So again, let me reiterate that apparently Amy Carlson, unsurprisingly, I hate to say it passed away. She claimed that she had cancer and then obviously there was the drug and alcohol abuse and she went from a gorgeous, beautiful woman to not healthy at all. And it was actually very frightening. She passed away some time ago and then they brought her to this house, this property slash compound to, quote, enshrine her in some way. So what that means is that Amy, mother God died. They transported her to this house slash compound while she was deceased and weakened at Bernie's her at some point in this house for who knows how long, anywhere from days to weeks. And it's being speculated weeks so that they could enshrine her in some like snow white and the seven effing dwarves type of way to, I guess, like continue worshiping her. I don't know. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't even know. I think that about sums it up. Happy Friday, guys. I'm sorry this episode is so late today, but it is. And there's nothing I can do about it. You're just gonna have to, you know, listen to it Saturday. You can find us at wesawthedevil.com. If you have any questions, concerns, commentary, I am, I need to reply to all of you who have emailed your um, cases, your hometown kind of cases or the cases that you're most interested in. I'm going to start going through those. So you can email us if you have something at info at we saw the devil.com. As always, we have a Patreon uh, for our patrons. I was waiting on specialty envelopes for your welcome packages. So the last of them went out. So the postcards and or the specialty envelopes, like for the welcome packages and stuff finally went out. So again, the overlap is going to be like the first week of May for postcards and welcome packages. But if you're interested in supporting and backing the show, you're liking it, you can do so at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil for as little as $3 a month, all the way up to $100 a month. You can support the show and get a variety of random benefits like postcards, t-shirts, merch, um, early access. Tomorrow, our patrons and I are playing a game. We're going to log online on Discord, on our Discord chat, play games and chat. So stuff like that. And beyond that, if you are liking the show, loving the show, do not forget to titty slap that subscribe button. If you haven't, leave a five-star review because we would appreciate it. So let's talk about sex. Sadism. And let's go with the American Psychological Association's definition of this. Pleasure through cruelty and inflicting pain, humiliation, and other forms of suffering on individuals. The term generally denotes sexual sadism. In the classic psychoanalytic theory of Sigmund Freud, sadism is attributed to the working of the death instinct and is manifested in innate aggressive tendencies expressed from the earliest stages of development, For example, during the oral biting phase, an infant expresses sadism by taking pleasure in biting. Now, sadism was constructed after the infamous French philosopher and writer, the Marquis de Sade. The Marquis de Sade. Or, as he shall be known in this episode, the Marquis de Sade. 
And if you haven't for, again, for some reason heard of him, do yourself a favor and actually do a little, re- do a little bit of research. There are a handful of books on him. He has quite a storied history. And there's almost 0% chance that you haven't learned of his impact even indirectly. There's the infamous movie, uh, The 120 Days of Sodom. There's the, the Hollywood movie, Quills. And in terms of true crime, Myra Henley and Ian Brady reportedly loved going to the library in order to read his work. Uh, specifically, Ian Brady would send Myra Henley in to actually check out books by the Marquis de Sade and his writings. Born in 1740 into nobility, he became known as a passionate and rambunctious child. And around 10 years old, he was sent to a Jesuit college, the Lycée Louis Le Grand in Paris, where he spent four years. And there, he was subjected to corporal punishment in the form of flagellation. He was made to bend over a desk or a, or a chair, and then they would flog him around his bare butt and his legs. It's said that during this time, he also witnessed his aunt having sex, and he was immediately beaten for being a voyeur. Either way, his pathological intersection between pleasure and pain began around this age. At age 14, he went to an elite military academy, and by 16, he was shipped off to fight in the Seven Year War. He was highly decorated and known for his recklessness as well as his bravery. And he ended up returning to Paris in 1763, just as the war ended. At that time, he was considered a bachelor and basically more or less a hero to some degree. He courted a rich magistrate's daughter, but the dad was like, nah, here, take the ugly one. And he offered her older sister. So they married and eventually had two sons and a daughter. One can imagine that the man whom the term sadism is coined after was into some really grody stuff. And that would be true. He was known very openly as a libertine. And a libertine is someone who basically has no moral or sexual restraint. Do as you wish. A lot of people at that time uh, used religion as their moral compass. So Most libertines are staunch atheists, and they do not believe that man should live by any sort of moral or sexual restraints. The Marquis de Sade became notorious for his sexual appetite and exploits, especially while he was married. He would travel through Paris and the surrounding towns, searching for and going to each brothel in the area. And because of his desire to flog and beat and otherwise degrade the prostitutes at these brothels, he established a name for himself in the underbelly of Paris. And it wasn't a good one. He would kidnap women from brothels and bring them back to his residence where he would then tie them up, sometimes drug them, and then rape them. He became so well known for assault that Parisian police would preemptively warn brothel owners about allowing women to leave with him. Like the popo, I guess, would like just stroll up on horseback and be like, the marquis is on the move. You need to tell your, your girls not to go with him. Now, a lot of members of the public, many members of the public went to the police to report basically the like effed up shiz that he was into. Um, either through one night stands, kidnapping people, his visits to a brothel. Everyone pretty much knew about it. And he made no attempts to hide his proclivities. So Desaad was finally put under surveillance by police who logged his movement and his activities. Finally, on Easter Sunday, 1768, there was the Rose Keller incident. Oh, Rose. Rose was a 36-year-old German immigrant and widow Her husband was a baker, and he had actually recently passed away, causing her to lose everything, become destitute, and she was living on the streets, begging in order to basically survive. So Desaad, now 28 years old, approached her and asked her if she would be interested in becoming his maid, his hired help. And so the two actually had a fairly lengthy exchange and he was like my bedroom (laughs) and she was like, I'm not that kind of woman, you know, like what exactly do you, do you need my services for? And he basically said, no, 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 it's completely legitimate. I just basically need house staff. So Rose agreed and they both set off to the Marquis de Sade's residence. Unsurprisingly, upon arrival, she was immediately led to his bedroom and 
poor Rose still believed that he was just going to show her where he needed her cleaning assistance. So Rose was initially completely unconcerned. That was until Desaad orders her to take off all of her clothes. She asks him why, and he says to, quote, have fun. She tells him that she did not go there for that. So then Assad drew his knife and threatened to kill her if she did not have sex with him. So he then tied both her arms and her legs to the corners of a four-post bed, and he then took his time slicing her body with a knife and poured hot wax all over the wounds before raping her. When it was all over, Assad's demeanor changed entirely. He held Rose as she cried and put ointment on her, at that point, then bleeding wounds. He untied her and instructed her to clean the blood out of her clothes in a wash basin. And then he just left the room and locked it behind him, essentially imprisoning her, trapping her there. And in a badass bitch move, Rose traumatized and she still managed to pry open a window with a piece of furniture that she broke off and she used the bed sheets and some of her clothing that she tied into a makeshift rope and then lowered herself from a third story window to the ground. Are you tired of the guess and test method when it comes to hair care? Formulate is the world's first personalized hair care formulation chemistry service. Work with your chemist to design the best shampoo and conditioner you have ever used. Each custom formulation is designed based on your own unique characteristics and adjusted based on your feedback and progress. Head on over to www.formulate.co forward slash podcast. Complete the brief hair questionnaire and use my code devil at checkout. Order today and you will get the second order free. Once again, that's www.formulate.co forward slash podcast and use my code devil at checkout, or you can follow the link below in the show notes and description. So she immediately went to the police and that was the final break that they needed. So Marquis de Sade was immediately arrested and interred in the Chateau de Seymour, which was then a prison. And side note, this all happened less than a year after he married his wife. So he spent less than a year in prison, was released, and then immediately upon his, I guess, release, was like YOLO and immediately went back to doing the exact same thing. Frequenting brothel, kidnapping women. So eventually the police were like, we can't handle this anymore. And he was eventually exiled back to his residence outside of Paris in 1772. His wife and his primary staff remained behind at their Parisian residence, their residence in Paris. So now Desaad was all alone in a big house like residence completely by himself. What does he do? He wasted no time looking for new staff. Even though he was confined to house arrest, and for the most part, he did abide by that, He skirted this by basically continuously hiring servants that he repeatedly tortured and raped. Police, upon hearing this, because what would happen is he would hire someone, he would drag them into his like sexcapades, mass orgies, people and aristocrats from Paris would actually even visit him. And he was notorious for mass orgies and actually forcing his own staff to participate in it. So staff would constantly be leaving and going to police and being like, hey, this crazy bastard over here made me do X, Y, P, and Q. So the police finally, once again, began to surveil his residence. Now, in the ultimate display of a mom protecting her shitbag son, and we've seen a million of these, right? We all know the person or the mom who has the shitbag son who has like, arrest warrants a mile long he would literally beat a kitten if it meant getting him like whatever he wanted drugs car stealing we've all met the mother who's like i love him and we'll just do anything for him so that was marquis de sade's mother she didn't care how many women he raped tortured whatever drugged she was like i love my son what does she do she actually goes and secures a royal order protecting him from the jurisdiction of the courts. What that essentially means is that it's an order directly from the king or the royal court in their own words, basically saying this man is so important that the courts can't touch him. It essentially made him free to subject any unsuspecting person 
to his sexual whims and desires with no repercussions whatsoever. I guess, unfortunately for him, his wife and children eventually joined him in his countryside residence, but that didn't stop him at all. In fact, his personal manservant, Latour, became his like right-hand man, and he and Latour took their show on the road. Because, you see, Marquis de Sade, as a libertine, he was openly sexual. He slept with both men and women. And he would consistently not only have sex with his servant Latour, but he would also use Latour to procure young, unsuspecting victims as well. Also, I guess now's as good of time as any to say that, yeah, the Marquis de Sade was, by all modern standards, a pedophile. He would actually rape and assault children of both genders. So in 1772, he and Latour left the countryside residence. We need to go kidnap and rape and assault more people. Yeah, let's go. So while in Marseille, they poisoned four prostitutes with Spanish fly, sodomized them while having sex, and then one another in a drug-fueled orgy. And then they left. They fled, which was pretty much their MO. They would like hit up somewhere, rape, abuse, torture, and then just flee. They were sentenced to death in absentia for the sodomy, for the act of sodomy. And because of that, they fled France. They went to Italy. So what does Marquis de Sade do? He doesn't take his wife. He doesn't take his children. He takes his wife's sister, the one that he was promised to all along. He's like, nope, you and me, sis, we're going. He takes his wife's sister and Latour, his manservant, and they go to Italy. They flee. They go to Italy. And then, of course, naturally, de Sade began a sexual relationship with his wife's sister because, of course, he did. They waited in Italy just for a few months when they thought the coast was clear, and then they made their way back to France. Shortly after crossing the border, though, they were all captured and imprisoned. Now, the two men, Latour and Assad, escaped the prison four months later. They ended up making their way back to the countryside home, where Dussaud actually hid out with his wife until 1774, so a couple more years. There is no further record on what happened to Latour, other than him uh, making it back to de Sade's residence. There is nothing on him, apparently, on historical record past that point. And then things go from bad to worse from there. De Sade's wife, Renée Cordier, becomes his accomplice. She would take part in orgies, rapes, druggings, and assaults. They even kidnapped, enslaved, and sexually abused together six children. On top of this, his wife was now on the, hey, let's post an ad for a servant and make them our sex slave game that the Sade had going for a while. So they now, together as a couple, committed many atrocities against their hired help. And most of their servants fled their residence, again, putting them on the local police's radar. In an interesting scenario, a father of one of these young female servants actually confronted the Marquis de Sade once. He walked up to him with a pistol drawn, pointed it directly at his face at point blank range and pulled the trigger, but it jammed. So again, the Parisian police were like, I guess we really do have to do something about this like pedophilic piece of garbage is raping and kidnapping everyone. So they devised a plan. They sent word to de Sade's country residence that his mother was deathly ill and had requested his presence. The actual truth of the matter, however, was that she had died months prior. But, you know, when word travels a little bit more slowly back in the late 1700s when it's basically pigeon and horseback. So he had no idea. Plus, he was pretty much the black sheep of most of the family. So it's likely that no one else would have alerted him to that. So de Sade set out for Paris and was almost immediately apprehended, basically upon like entering city limits. So he once again was sent to jail. That prison was eventually shut down. And so he was moved to the infamous Bastille in 1784. And that was just five years before the French Revolution. But here at the Bastille is where he began to write. That's what he's primarily known for. And he actually started to write when he was imprisoned in the Bastille. A guard would sneak him tiny rolls of paper where he began to write Les cent vingt journées de Sodom, or what English speakers, speakers such as myself, know as the 120 days of Sodom. The book was turned into a film, which is considered to be one of the most vile and difficult to watch films ever made. I love it. I have it. It is actually part of the Criterion Collection and is considered to be one of the most influential films ever made. 
The film is loosely based on the book, but the book chronicles four noblemen who decide to experience absolute sexual pleasure in the most filthy and degenerate ways possible. 600 of them, to be exact. The most shocking part of 120 Days of Sodom is where basically they kidnap um, a bunch of teenagers from the local village for um, whatever reasons, and they actually make them eat big bowls of their poop, of their feces. It is absolutely disgusting. But that film came out in the 70s. So in any case, on July 4th of 1789, Marquis de Sade was moved to a mental hospital in Paris where he would frequently yell out of his window to passersby on the street that guards at the Bastille were killing people. And he had no chance to grab his 120 Days of Sodom manuscript and thought it would be lost forever. They came and they grabbed him out of his cell. They moved him to a, a mental hospital in Paris and he thought left his manuscript behind. And he, at that time, apparently considered it his best work. Just 10 days later, the single most important moment of French history happened. The Bastille was stormed and destroyed. And a completely random fact that the manuscript to 120 Days of Sodom was not lost. In fact, a man by the name of Arnaud de Saint-Maximin discovered and saved the manuscript just two days before the storming of the Bastille. So that is actually how 120 Days of Sodom was basically found, published, and is available for public consumption. And as everyone knows, the revolutionaries took over the government and executed a bunch of aristocrats, most of them, as well as a lot of their compatriots. They also emptied out most of the prisons and mental hospitals, which a lot of people don't know because they were filled with revolutionaries or people unfairly imprisoned for whatever reason. And our boy Marquis de Sade got yet another literal get out of jail free card at that time. What does he do? I mean, he was part of that greedy, excessive aristocracy that the revolutionaries were railing against. So surely the revolutionaries would have, would have sent him to the guillotine. Nope, 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 none of that. The Marquis de Sade was apparently so charismatic that he convinced them that he was a large supporter of their faction and even made several official appointments to office. He actually worked in various government offices. So also in 1790, aside from the revolution, de Sade's wife finally divorced him and he ended up having a relationship with a young actress, Marie Constance Quinet. And by all accounts, the two were actually madly in love, and she was very accepting of his proclivities, being like, oh, you want to go kidnap and rape someone tonight? Go for it. She just completely did not care. During this time, he also went back to writing, and his big claim to fame was actually two novels, Justine and Juliet. These were his big public claims to fame. They are two separate books that tell the stories of two sisters. They were rich aristocrats who became orphans due to their father's financial dealings. So they are both sent to an abbey where they are both sexually abused and corrupted by nuns. Juliet ends up being the libertine and the book Justine chronicles her sexcapades and complete like crazy libertine lifestyle. Justine initially remained virtuous and fought corruption at basically every turn, pushing her further into violent sexual scenarios. So you have basically the two separate sides of morality. So Justine's book is called Justine, The Misfortunes of Virtue. And I'm going to read a synopsis from a 1988 New York Times article about Justine. And the article reads, quote, Dismissed at 14 years of age from a convent in which she had been educated, she must defend her virtue from the assaults of debauchees who offer financial ease in exchange for sexual favors. She stoutly defends her moral principles and sees herself lowered to the position of servant in the household of an avaricious man who tries to induce her to steal from a neighbor. She refuses, and in reprisal, she is accused falsely of theft and imprisoned. By becoming an accomplice in an arson that kills several prisoners, she succeeds in escaping only to be raped. She takes refuge in the castle of a young Count de Brassac, a homosexual who turns out to be another monster cruel and perverse. Because she refuses to help him in the poisoning of his mother, she is nearly devoured by the Count's ferocious mastiffs loosed against her. Picked up by another libertine, she is branded with a hot iron and expelled. 
What are we to make of this succession of tortures, whippings, flayings, incisions, burns, poisonings, vivisections, beatings, and humiliations? And that, folks, is Justine's book. Both of these novels horrified the people of France. It horrified them. They were utterly disgusted. The books caused such an uproar that they were actually brought directly to Napoleon himself, Napoleon Bonaparte. And he actually personally ordered Marquis de Sade to be arrested and imprisoned without trial. And so he was. He was sent to the St. Pelagie prison without trial. And at that time, he was 61 years old. In 1803, he was moved back to the asylum in Paris because he was found to be seducing and having sex with other inmates. His ex-wife and three children actually paid for his room, board, and maintenance. So, I mean, he had apparently one of the nicest rooms. He was able to bring anything that he wanted, have visitors at any time that he wanted. And he was actually allowed to continue writing. And he wrote stage plays. The public actually came to see them. He used inmates as actors and was able to actually write a lot of plays. Now, during this time, remember his young actress girlfriend, Marie Constance? So she pretended to be his wife and was actually permitted to move into the asylum with him next door. Like she lived in a, a little private room next door to the Sad, next door to the Sad, while he went and did all of his stuff. Like I seriously cannot imagine that level of devotion that if your boyfriend goes into an insane asylum, you're like, I want to go live there with him beside him in the next room over. I do not even know what that is. In any case, he didn't give a shit. He began having a sexual relationship with the 14-year-old daughter of an employee in the facility, and that affair lasted more than four years. The Marquis de Sade died at that asylum on December 2nd, 1814, at age 74. He had apparently been sick for quite a while, having violent pain in both of his testicles as well as his abdomen. And I will read a quick excerpt from his final will and testament. He wrote, I categorically forbid the dissection of my body for any purpose whatsoever. I must pressingly request that it be kept for 48 hours in the room in which I die. During this time, an express messenger shall be sent to a firewood merchant to take my body in his care, transport it in the said firewood wagon to the woods on my property, where I wish it to be placed without any sort of ceremony once the grave is filled in, acorns are to be scattered over it so that in time the grave is again overgrown and when the undergrowth is grown as it was before, the traces of my grave will vanish from the face of the earth as I like to think memory of me will be effaced from men's minds. Despite his request that his body be left alone for 48 hours before burial on his property... He was instead buried at the insane asylum at the Sheraton Asylum and his skull was then removed to be studied. He was given a very cheap, like a pauper's bar Christian burial at a remote site at the very far end of the asylum graveyard. And his grave was actually marked with a very small white stone cross, which is slightly humorous as he was actually a very militant atheist. After his death, his sons actually burned dozens of unpublished manuscripts. So there is a ton of work out there that never got published. However, most of his work actually survived, and the modern public has now, now has access to a wide variety of his written work. And, the, I mean, the man, the myth, the legend, right? So here are five fun facts about the Marquis de Sade. Number one is his skull went missing, and no one knows where it went. After his death, multiple doctors studied it, and one ended up actually taking it on a world tour to sold-out crowds. I shit you not. After that, it just disappeared. People from all over regions would come to see his, his skull because he became so notorious. Uh, number two, he obviously gave us the word sadism because look at his life and look at what he was into. Number three, in his book, Philosophy in the Bedroom, the Marquis de Sade proposed the use of induced abortion for social reasons and population control. This is actually the first time documented in world history that abortion was discussed in a public manner and likely the reason also why Western society became more familiar with such a concept. Uh, four, his work influenced Nietzsche, Flaubert, and Voltaire. Again, three of the biggest philosophers and writers in 
in French history, he actually influenced them. And then from a feminist perspective, it's actually very, 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 very interesting. A lot of the early feminists say that he was disgusting, that, you know, he was a rapist, a pedophile, and all of these things, that his work had no redeeming value whatsoever. And then there actually have been a lot of feminist academics who have come out and said that you have to look at it from a different lens, that a lot of the women in his writings aren't the damsels in distress who are taken against their will, but women who come into their own sexuality and willingly take part in the debauchery and acts of filth. So just, he has been just so completely controversial for so long. And it's actually really interesting. Uh, His descendants, because don't forget he had three children, his descendants were so ashamed of him that they, you know, hid from public view. They didn't do interviews. They, Um, still actually owned in the family some of the properties and they closed it all down. And that was until about 15 years ago when one of his descendants is like, no, like we should be proud of who he was and the mark that he left on the world because obviously he left a huge one. France also, he was kind of France's dirty secret for a very, very, very long time. And now France actually openly celebrates him, his work, and considers him a national treasure. But that is, guys, that is the story of the Marquis de Sade. I wanted to throw that out there. I thought it would be a fun episode considering the subject matter that we are confronting. Um, There will actually be a part three that will be coming out next week. And that is when we are going to talk about pornography, sex crime, and different paraphilias as far as the different research has come out connecting violent sexual crime and pornography. And again, it's very interesting, tying it back to insects, that both insect, the creator of insects um, and many, many, many serial killers have actually drawn on the Marquis de Sade and whatever work they just happen to read as uh, being an influence on their thought process or sexual interests. So it's just, it all comes full circle, doesn't it, guys? So that is it for today's episode. I hope you learned something. I left out a lot of information. There's a, a good bit of additional information out there about the Marquis de Sade. If you are interested in him, he is fascinating. And what's even more fascinating is learning all of the different ways that he actually influenced society for the better at times, mind you, too. Influence society in, what it, in so many different ways that you may not even be aware of. There are those rare people throughout history that it's almost like a Forrest Gump, right? The movie Forrest Gump, where it's just over and over and over him hitting the most iconic milestones of American history throughout the time that he was he was alive. The Marquis de Sade was actually just like that as well. I mean, he knew Napoleon. He w- was there for the guillotines, the French Revolution, and definitely suggest if you're interested, checking out 120 Days of Sodom. If you're looking for something a little less unsavory, uh, check out Quills. It has Kate Winslet and Jeffrey Rush. That is the story of his later years while he is in prison. But that is it for today, guys. Thank you for listening. Uh, as always, if you're enjoying the show, you can check us out on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil where as for little as three dollars a month you can support the show love the show like the show and get some cool benefits while doing it i will see you next week with part three of this episode and as well as a Lori vallow update guys because i just have a feeling we're gonna have some big stuff come out this next week beyond that don't forget if you are listening titty slap that subscribe button follow our show and don't forget to follow us on instagram facebook or twitter thanks again guys until next crime